really the way that, that we kind of uh, started out this process was we had a platform technology and we were meeting with lots of our customers. Um, and we had some kind of common themes that kept coming up with what they were trying to do in the T-cell space on, on analyzing the function of their T-cells. And, and so, you know, it's just some, some basic questions came up, like how do you visualize thousands of diverse cell interactions? So how do you take two cells, put them together, watch what happens, and see the result? Um, and then, in addition, most of our uh, groups that we were working with were looking for ways to measure um, individual cell cytotoxicity. So not just, you know, do I put my construct into a group of cells and see is there killing, but how many of the individual cells that have my TCR or my CAR are actually killing a tumor cell, and how many of those tumor cells are they killing through time? And finally, um, you've, you've done all this work to profile your cells, and you've, you've got all this inf interesting uh, information, how do you recover those cells actually back out of, of the system alive in, in a lot of cases, which is one of our key challenges. So when we look at today, um, if you want to do things like this, you're, you're usually going through many different tools, taking a long, long time, and, and mostly using destructive assays to do these measurements. So you're not able to recover those cells alive at the end. And so really where, where Berkeley's technology is, is positioned is, is to enable you to automatically clone thousands of individual cells, and we'll show you how we do that, um, and set up um, as many cell-cell interactions with multiple different cell types, and then continuously assay these through time, through multiple days, multiple, multiple different assays with culture, watching what's happening in time lapse, and then linking all of that complex phenotypic data that you've built up to a genotype in the end. Um, so that you can recover and select those, those individual clones of interest. And of course, we're doing this on a single platform. So this is uh, the platform that we've built and we call it digital cell biology. Um, essentially, the way that our workflows work uh, is that we usually come in with a cell pool, usually a diverse set of, of cells. Um, and this is the, an image of the beacon platform. It's about the size of a minus 80. And we try and do almost the entire workflow within that single platform, all computer controlled, which is why we call it digital cell biology. Um, and the result is either data or actual cell lines coming out the other side um, in, a, in a well plate. So really the magic of the system was the optofluidic chips that we developed over the course of about three years. Uh, shown here, it's about two inches by two inches. And within the size of a postage stamp, um, we have what we call nano pen chambers. And so if we zoom in to this, this kind of microfluidic uh, flow, we have 3,500 chambers in one postage stamp size. So it's like 10 384 well plates in, in a very small volume. And, and really the, the, the simple trick that we use um, is to use light to move individual cells um, precisely and with computer control. And so what's happening in this image is it looks um, easy. It took us quite a while to figure this out. Um, but essentially, we have uh, a grid pattern on the floor. Um, you can see here all these little pixels. So on one chip, there's 4 million pixels. So essentially, your cell is sitting on a cell phone camera sensor. And when we shine light on that little pixel, we can activate uh, basically an electric field that repels cells or particles. And so wherever we shine light, we can move cells, essentially. And then we also created basically a floor to ceiling wall, and this is a dead end alley, um, to, to isolate those cells so that we can grow them and culture them and monitor them through, through time. And so if we perfuse media or um, reagents like antibodies that are fluorescent through what we call the main channel in this area, they'll diffuse into that nano pen and provide the cells with nutrients for culture or label them for, for imaging. And so what we're launching um, actually this summer is what we call our T-cell functional analytics workflow. And I'll give you kind of a few different flavors of this. Um, essentially, we're bringing in a batch of T-cells. We're functionally screening them um, by combining them with an antigen presenting cell, watching what they do, and measuring actually the secretion of interferon gamma from a single cell um, in real time. And so this is just a quick snapshot. And I'll walk you through each of these uh, through the talk. And really what we get at the end is a, a, a snapshot or the data that provides what, what those T cells are actually doing as well as those live T cells back out. So we built um, the Beacon platform to do many different things. And the first thing that we do is we have to load these T cells. Um, and we've actually built uh, the fluorescence capability to act similar, similar to a fax order. And so this, in this video, you'll see us basically setting gates. Uh, the first gate we set is just for single cells that are by themselves. 
Um, and so the machine vision will actually image every single cell uh, in the chip. And then what we're showing down on the bottom right is basically the equivalent of an imaging cytometer. So you can see all the cells. You can see uh, green are those that fall within the gate. Red are the doublets that we want to avoid. Um, and then we can activate a predefined gate that is basically uh, CD8 positive, CD4 negative, um, shown here. And then if we click on any cell, either on the image or in the, the fax plot, um, basically it'll highlight the, the exact cell in the data and also where it is on the chip. Um, and then you can verify all the images and kind of make sure that the, the machine is identifying the cells you want. And then you can set it off and say, okay, go pen as many of those cells with it falls into those gates into the nano pens. And so what we get is um, basically a summary of all the cells that are in those channels. Um, so here we were looking at CD8 positive, tetramer positive cells. So in, in one of these runs, in, in one load, we got 2,500 cells screened, of which 1,757 were um, double positive. And so we can plot that in Flojo. And then once we've set the machine to go off on its own, now it's basically using those gates to identify cells. So that's tetramer stain, that's CD8 stain, and you'll see the light cages appear just on the cells that, have, that are double positive. And then we have this diamond shape, which is basically like a snow plow, because we have a lot of cells that are loaded very densely. And then we take images post-loading and verify that they're still um, the ones that we want. And so really, this gives us the exquisite control to, to perfectly get those cells and then verify that we got the right ones. If we ever get two cells in there, we can just abandon them, pull them out, do whatever we want. So, um, you know, once we get these cells loaded, uh, the next thing that we're really doing is focusing on kind of visualizing these diverse cell interactions. So the first vignette we'll talk about is a tumor killing assay that we developed. Um, and so to set this up, um, this is one of the first assays we did actually. Uh, on the left, you can see we have uh, T cells. They're, they're not labeled. Um, so you, you actually can't see them very well in this image. Uh, and then we have multiple tumor cells that are labeled in red. And on the right, we have uh, a similar setup, but the tumor cell line is not expressing the antigen in this case. So it's acting as our negative control. Um, and then everywhere in the media, we have a caspase 3 indicator dye. So whatever cell is activating caspase 3 will glow green. And then we do uh, a seven hour time lapse. And you can see on the left, each tumor cell activate uh, caspase 3 almost one at a time as those T cells are kind of attacking each tumor cell in succession. And then um, I think what's really you know, unique and interesting about the system is that we're imaging 3,500 of these nanopens at the same time, but you can actually drill down on one interaction and watch that T cell, you know, in this case, dancing around that tumor cell. Here we've got, uh, we've flipped the, the label so the tumor cell is labeled in green. And I'll play that again. When it activates caspase, it turns blue. So you can really watch that T cell as it's interacting with that, that tumor cell through time. So that was the, the first kind of um, proof of concept that we did. And then we started building uh, cytokine assays. So uh, Berkeley Lights does a lot of work with uh, B cells, plasma B cells, CHO cells, screening antibodies. And so we have a lot of experience with diffusion-based assays capturing secreted molecules. And so what we've, we built here is basically we load an antigen-positive cell. It's either a T2 cell expressing antigen, a dendritic cell, or a tumor line. Um, and when you have a T cell that interacts with that uh, antigen MHC complex, you'll secrete interferon gamma. And then essentially we have a sandwich ELISA on a bead in this uh, nano pen as well. And again, because we can precisely position individual particles together, we can actually do this three different particles together in the same nano pen. And so if, um, if there's interferon produced, you'll see uh, this interferon, anti-interferon fluorophore build up on that bead and, and give a positive signal. So this is what it looks like to load. Um, the first thing that we'll load is the beads. Um, and here we're trying to load as many as possible. Um, and then we come in with uh, human primary T cells on the second load. And again, we've got some complicated light patterns going. And so we're bringing each of these. And we only load these with pens that have a bead. So you'll see the one that doesn't have a bead, it's just avoiding that altogether. And then the third load is a T2 cell load. And here we asked it to do at least one, but if they, it could get two, um, it would do that as well. And I think what we didn't really appreciate when we first started this is that 
precisely putting all of these together, very close proximity, ensures that at that timestamp, when that light turns off, we know exactly when that interaction starts. And if we don't put the T cell right next to the tumor cell, it, it takes some time for it to find its friend to interact with. Um, and so we've, we've changed light patterns to basically push everything together right at the same time. Um, and so here's, here's some of the data from um, the positive control. Uh, and so we'll have the interaction. And this is an image of uh, the bead itself showing that it's interferon positive. Um, and then what you can see here is basically the, the spread of, of these cells. So what's in red here are what we've, we've gated as negative for interferon uh, secretion. And in this box up here um, is a wide range of interferon expression. And what's really interesting about this population is that we tetramer sorted this. So these are 90% positive for tetramer. But when you go and do a cytotoxicity interaction with a real MHC on a real cell and look at interferon response, it's highly variable. Um, and so you're really starting to see kind of these populations diverge to the point where these guys are expressing a ton and these guys are more moderate expressors. Now you can reach in and grab any one of those and say, okay, what do I want? What's the TCR from the moderate expressors or the low expressors, not just the super high expressors? And in this negative control, um, these tumor cells do not express antigen. We see very few, if, if any, um, positive for this cytokine assay. And then we can also check basically the map. And so if we take a map of, um, of this chip, the size of um, the circle is basically indicates whether it's interferon positive or not. And actually, because we know where we're loading things, we can place all the negatives in one region. We see that they're all interferon negative. Um, and then we have all the positive controls down at the bottom. And blue basically means that it had no tumor cell with it. So there is some cells that are either pre-activated um, going into the chip that will secrete interferon without any tumor cell around. And so we can see all of that because we have all of those controls kind of built into the same chip. Um, so that was our first kind of interferon gamma assay, and then we started layering things on top like phenotyping the T cell themselves. Um, and so here what we're doing is not only are we doing the same setup with the interferon gamma bead, but we're now we're adding an anti-CD137 um, stain, so looking for 41BB. So now we're looking at not only is it expressing a marker of activation on the surface, but also it's activating and, and expressing interferon gamma. So we'll see yellow uh, if there's interferon, and we'll see blue if it's 137 positive. And rather than looking at these, because it's a little bit hard to see, um, if you look here on the right, you've got an interaction here uh, that's blue on the T cell and yellow on the interferon assay, and the same over here, even though it's a little bit hard to see. And then you've got an interaction here where there's no CD137 and there's no interferon being secreted. And the nice thing is that we can start mapping these populations. And so what I'm showing on, on the left uh, is basically two different donors um, and, and one replicate of this donor one. And you can see here on SLC45 is actually the, the correct antigen that these um, cells should be reacting against. And then we have TCL1 that's serving as our negative control, and we kind of look at the ratio of these two. And you can see that there's, there's more nonspecific activation by TCL1 in donor 1 than there is in donor 2. Um, and then we can drill down even further and look at, okay, so those that, are, that should be our positive control, they should be reacting. How many of those are CD137 uh, positive? And it's about 60%. Um, so 60% of the cells are 137 positive and are secreting uh, interferon gamma. 40% are not 137 positive. So what does that mean? We don't know yet. It could be a timing thing. It's just they haven't activated yet. So we're starting to work out kind of when they turn on things, when their surface expression comes on, some of the basic biology of activation. So this is kind of where we're starting this summer um, with the first application. And then things we're working on now is, well, now let's get really crazy and put four different things together. So now we're doing a TNF bead as well. Um, so we can look at basically um, whether these cells are secreting interferon and TNF. And we have actually done uh, three different cytokines in the same uh, run as well. And then once we've done all this, we want to recover that exact interaction that we like. So here's an example. Um, we have a, a record of which nanopen we're on. So this is nanopen 3,441. 
Um, and we can see basically the loads. So we can see the bead plus the T cell on the left, and then we have the two tumor cells that get loaded. Then we culture overnight. Um, and the next day, we have positivity for interferon gamma. And then we use our light to take this group back out. So you can, if you're really good, you can culture these cells, although they're single. They don't like to, to culture too well by themselves. Um, a lot of people are doing TCR sequencing on these um, and doing some validation in that way. So the way that, that these are being used, um, I would say, you know, it's really on the kind of screening and validation stage. So you've narrowed it down to your favorite CAR-T constructs and different variants of them, or you've got 10 different TCRs you want to mix and match and see, you know, which ones are reacting with the, the best phenotype. Um, we're doing some work with uh, TCR discovery and validation, and basically you're doing the discovery and the validation in the same assay. Um, so you don't have to do a functional kind of re-expression on the back end. Um, and then also some work on looking at kind of how regulatory T cells are interacting with CD8s and things like that. Um, and just some, some different um, interactions that we've played with and some of our early access customers have played with. So that's, that's the first bit of the talk. Um, and then I'd like to do a quick vignette on kind of how we're using these capabilities in, in a fairly different way. But again, the, the thread here is with T cells. And so this was a pap paper that we actually published with UCSF um, last year. And it was about human primary T cell gene editing uh, as an alternative use, use case. And so what, what we did with UCSF here is we actually electroporated um, a CRISPR-Cas9 construct into human primary T cells that were CD4 positive. And then we clone them on the chip um, and let them expand into colonies and then stain them for a phenotype. In this case, we're trying to knock out CXCR4. So we're actually looking for cells that do not express CR CXCR4 anymore. And then we do a split export. So we take half the culture uh, and take it out for lysis and sequencing. And then the other half goes into banking for expansion. So we did a couple different ways um, looking at kind of how long after electroporation we should clone. Um, it was very clear that um, after only one day of rest, only about 10% of these cells would grow out into colonies. If we waited four days, they were much happier and they grew into about 40%. We don't think this is the chip per se. It's just being cloned into a single cell is stressful for cells. We've, we've done this on millions of cells now, um, and they, most cells don't like to be alone, especially human primary T cells. Um, and so you can see their doubling times are, are much faster in the, those that get arrested for, for longer. Um, this is a map of the chip. Uh, this is a negative control um, uh, CRISPR edit, so this shouldn't knock out CXCR4. You can see a lot of expression still maintained here, which is shown in purple. I don't know if you can make that out. Um, and then this is a very efficient edit. So almost all of the other cells look negative uh, on the chip, and you can see that here. So in the controls, they stain very brightly uh, for CXCR4. And in the, um, the positive knockouts, most of them, up to about 95%, had phenotypically what looked like full knockouts. And then this is a, just a video of the split export. And so, because we can program the light to do whatever we want, we basically kind of shepherd half the colony out, squirt it out into a well plate, and then we take the other half and bank it. Um, and you can see here it grows out into a clone over seven days. Uh, I don't have the data here, but there's a clear um, number of cells. So if you get to 10 cells into a 96 well plate, most of those will grow into colonies. Below that, they tend not to. They just like be together. We also export into round bottom plates so that all the cells roll, roll down and are basically right next to each other. And then this is the sequencing results. So um, the collaborator we're working with, Alex Marson at UCSF, was actually looking for dual HDR um, in this locus. And so what we're showing here is the genomic locus and where the guide RNA is cutting. And if we get homologous recombination, we'll see this pink sequence. So it's actually a knock-in, knock-out. Um, and this it introduces a, an enzyme, restri a restriction enzyme site. And you can see out of the 100 clones that we profiled, all of which were negative phenotypically for CXCR4, um, we only found two that had both alleles homologously recom recombined. Um, and so because we've cloned these, um, this data was, was quite clean, although we still see some mixtures here. We actually think that's multiple edits happening even after the first cell division. There's editing still going on. Um, and then even some that looked phenotypically like knockouts were wild type by genotype. 
And so this was all done basically in, in less than a week. Um, and so that's really kind of where, where we find the power of the system is these full workflows that include culture and, and really kind of dramatic down selection going on inside the chip. So I will close there and just kind of do the summary, which is um, our tagline, which is function you can see. It's really about using time-lapse imaging and, and doing multiple assays through time to visualize these diverse cell interactions, measure individual cell cytotoxicity, and then recover those cells of interest alive. Um, and just for a frame of reference, I also model as an instrument person. Um, but uh, this is what the beacon looks like in our lab. Um, and happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention.